that's what I want to talk about this morning, the necessity of asking questions. Why have a mind unless you're meant to use it? That is a question that I was afraid to ask as a young child. Because what I was taught that the, was that the question itself was heresy. Just asking the question meant you didn't have any faith, which meant you're going to hell. And so when I would read things in the Bible that directly contradicted each other, I was afraid to say, well, wait a minute, did it happen this way or did it happen this way? If this is the inspired word of God, which one? Those are the kinds of questions that can get you in a lot of trouble in traditional churches, and yet they're exactly the kinds of questions that we have to ask. Because anything, any ideology, any religion, any politics, anything that is left unquestioned becomes dangerous. Then you're accepting someone else's word for what affects your life deeply. And God gave you a brain. You're not going against God to use your brain. I think you're going against God if you put your brain on the shelf and say, I've already been told what's true, so I don't need to think about it. I don't need to use this brain. I don't need to use my heart or my mind or my soul. I don't believe that's what God is telling us, ever. So when we don't ask questions, we accept agreements that are made unconsciously. We've been, we talked a few weeks ago about the four agreements. We accept whatever's been given to us. What did our parents believe? What did they tell us to believe? If we don't ask questions and that's what, they, that's what we believe, and then we perpetuate whatever it is that's going on. And I don't know about y'all, but when you look around in the world, out there, what we're perpetuating isn't working that well to a very large degree. And so we need to ask ourselves, and I love this idea that Jesus said, if you want to know the nature of things, know yourself deeply. Because guess what? We're all one. If you want to know the world, know yourself. And if you want to make pronouncements on what the world is without knowing yourself, then you are living in poverty. And you don't have to live in poverty. You can live in abundance. So religion is especially dangerous because the threat of going against it is, so, is not just like something bad will happen to you in this life, but as I was raised, it's an eternal hell where you will wish for the mountains to come down upon you and you will wail and you will gnash your teeth. And the mountains won't come down upon you because you're not finished burning yet and you never will be. That's what I was taught as a wee child. That's still in there, y'all. <laughs> still in there somewhere. But I had to question it. I had to question it. And in most modern Christianity, when I started asking questions and really looking and really reading what is written deeply, what I realize is that a lot of Christianity is not following the way of Christ because the way of Christ is love, 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 love. In any and all circumstances, the only answer is love. And instead, what modern Christianity to a large degree does is it worships this book that was written thousands of years ago by human beings who had agendas, who had cultures, who had reasons for keeping things the way they were or for changing them. And if we don't know anything about that, and, and it was written even after thousands of years of it just being stories. You ever play a game of rumors or telephone, whatever you call it, where you sit around in a circle and you whisper something in somebody's ear, and when it gets back to you, it's like totally different? Imagine that times a thousand years. Really, we're telling stories. My dad was a great storyteller. I loved to tell my dad a story and then come back in a couple of months and hear what the story had become in his telling. I could tell a story this long and it would be like this long with all kinds of detail. He was a great storyteller. And you know what? When you're a great storyteller, then people want to listen to you. And that's how oral traditions get passed along. We tell the stories because they have a meaning, because they have a purpose, because they're trying to teach us something. But we don't expect people to believe that the story is the absolute truth forever and ever and ever and always. The Jews in early times did not believe that. They understood that these were teaching stories, not historical facts. 
And somehow we've backed ourselves into a corner as a culture too much of believing these as historical facts. And so, um, so the answer is it is written with some people. It's written. There it is. Bible said it. That's enough for me. Well, who wrote the Bible? It wasn't Jesus, y'all. It wasn't God. The first gospel was written 70 years after Jesus' death. The average um, age for people to live at that time was about 40, 42. So it's a full two generations after Jesus' death that they wrote down, here's what he said, after they had been carrying it and telling the stories over and over again. <coughs> Go back to the Old Testament. It was, it's not a book. It's a bunch of books written by a bunch of people over a long period of time. So it's important to ask anytime anybody says, here it is in black and white, it's especially important on the internet. <laughs> Who wrote it? Who wrote it? See if you can find out. When did they write it? Is it still relevant? What is the culture of the person who wrote it? That's very important. What is the culture? How was it written? How long was it passed down through oral uh, um, tradition? And what was their agenda? What were they hoping to accomplish? Who was it written for? What were they maybe reacting against or persuading? What did they have to gain? And if you read the Gospels, you will see that they, a, a lot of the stories are, are um, you see them across the Gospels, and a lot are very different. And a lot of them have stories that the others don't have at all. And if you notice, um, if you go back and look historically, some of those Gospels were written to the Romans. You know, the Roman centurion that had his had a conversion at the side of um, Jesus' crucifixion. That's only in one gospel, and it was the gospel that was being written for the Romans at the time to go, us Jews aren't so bad. Come on, join us. We're not dangerous. Other gospels were written to the Jewish people. Other gospels were written for the Gentiles. Paul was definitely writing for the Gentile, and he wasn't writing a gospel. He was writing what he thought. And he thought a lot of good things, but he also was a product of his culture. One of the things he thought that I was told over and over and over again, I didn't even need to be told, it was just obvious, is that we're in church, you are a woman, you do not speak. You don't speak, you don't pray, you don't pass the collection plate, you don't you don't pass the offering, you don't greet people at the door, you sit down and shut up. We see how well that worked. <laughs> Sit down and shut up is never something I did very well. <laughs> but it was understood, and I didn't. And I remember asking my mom when I was about like seven, because women didn't lead the singing either. And there was no instrumental music in the Church of Christ. There's only singing. And so unless you have somebody who has a really good ear leading the singing, it can get real ugly. Fortunately, usually there is somebody, but in the smaller churches, often there wasn't. There's some guy on a pitch pipe, and he's not really singing it right. And so I, as a good little music student, would sing extra loud to help the people around me get the actual tune, because the guy up there did not have it. And I remember asking my mom, and people would even say, oh, oh that was so beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. And I remember asking her, so does that make me a leader in the church? And does that, does that mean I'm going to hell? Because people were following my voice. They were following what I was singing. And when you start asking questions, it gets real. There's a lot of threads to pull. And my mom's answer was, I don't know. <laughs> Which is a good answer. It's a good answer. Certainty is dangerous. As soon as you are absolutely certain, then there is no room for more information. So I don't know is a really good place to start. And maybe that, I don't know, from my mom was what gave me permission to start asking the questions that I wanted to ask more deeply. I didn't ask my parents. I already knew what their answer was. But I started asking the questions of the world, of the Bible, of other scriptures, of other people, of books. And I started looking around me and looking within me to find answers. And do I have all the answers? Nuh-uh. The answer I have is love. And 
Do I believe that because Jesus said it? I don't think so. I think I believe that because everything within me knows that that is good and right. And when practice brings peace and brings happiness and brings joy and ceases to cause harm, as the Buddha said, and when I don't love, all of those opposite things become true. When I don't love, then I cause harm. I create war. I create jealousy. I create envy. I create violence when I don't love. And so the cool thing to me about Jesus, whom I love, is that he got that totally, that love was the answer. And he started a ministry to just say it over and over and over and over again to anyone who would listen. It's love and it's within you. It's love and you have to do it. You have to participate. You have to be part of it. If you want to heal, you have to know that you can be healed because you have to believe in who you are. Who you are is love. What you're supposed to do is love. Why are you here? It's love. And so Jesus was perhaps the greatest teacher because that's what he taught. Love isn't right because Jesus said it. Jesus said it because love is what is right. No thunderbolts. So we ask those questions. What are they, we reacting against? Who are we persuading? You know, one of the things that people, uh, 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 something that people use to defame Islam is what is written about women in the Quran, that women can only inherit half the property that their brothers can inherit from their fathers. Well, do you know, before the Quran, in that culture, women were not allowed to inherit anything, ever. And so when Muhammad put that down, it was a transformation in society that women had some power finally. They could own something. Until that time, they were owned and could not own anything. And so what was he doing? He was reacting to his culture. He was reacting to his culture. And was it the divine word of God? Did God to speak to him? Yeah, I think God spoke to him. I think God speaks to you. Are you listening? And I think when God speaks to me, I hear it through the ears of Melinda. All my history, all my worries, all my fears, all my beliefs, the things that I've learned, the things that I don't yet know, the things that I think I know but I'm wrong about. When I hear the voice of God, I hear it through that whole filter. And so I do the best I can, and I keep looking. And I think that's what we were meant to do, and I think that's what Muhammad did. And I know that's what Jesus did. So beyond religion is spirituality. So religion is the set of rules for how to behave spirituality is like, here are the rules, and if I obey them, then I'll be good. That's the way I was taught. Spirituality means, who am I? What is my spirit about? And when I know who I am, then I start to behave that way. We don't need rules. The rules are a nice guide, but if you love, you're not going to murder anybody or sleep with anybody's wife or steal their stuff, right? Once we know who we are, then the rules don't matter anymore. It's a, I think I read a scripture last week from um, the Bhagavad Gita that said, it's like scriptures are great until you look around and realize that every single thing around you is a scripture, that the voice of God is speaking through every single thing. So great, if scripture is what you need to hold on to until you can see that God is everywhere and in everything, then hold on to a scripture, but don't hold it so tightly that you can't ask a question about it. And know that you can hold on to it more and more loosely as you know who you truly are and begin to see God everywhere and in every one. Any ideology, creed, or dogma, there's always something to be gained, something to be profited by the people who wrote it down. Not saying that they all had a bad gain in mind or a bad profit in mind, but there's something to be gained. So look at that. Look at that. 
the same way you would question anything, the same way you should question every politician that tells you what you want to hear, because they're telling you what they want to, you want to hear because they want your vote. Do they really believe that? I don't know. You better ask a lot of questions about that. What does their behavior show beyond what the words are that they say? Question everything. Question everything. And question not to understand, because in this human form, we may never understand. Yesterday, I um, was called upon to do a memorial service for a baby that died at, at eight and a half months gestation. Happy, healthy pregnancy, and then just gone, just gone. And this young mother had to deliver this baby who had died a week before inside her. If I tried to preach a funeral and tell why that happened, first of all, I'd be the biggest hypocrite in the world. <laughs> And second of all, you can't, I don't know. I don't understand. So we're not always questioning why so we can understand. We're questioning so we can understand that what has been told us ain't necessarily so. And so that we can be pulled into the directions that make sense when we hold them against our own souls. When I teach class on Wednesdays, I say over and over again, don't believe this, just because this book says it doesn't mean it's true. Because I say it doesn't mean it's true. Whatever it is, if it resonates within you, hold it up to your heart and see, does it feel like truth? Practice it. Act from it. Do good things come from it? Just like the Buddha says, does happiness flow from it? Does peace, does friendship flow from that? Then it's probably true. But if it doesn't, then don't keep it. I don't care who said it. I don't care how sacred they are purported to be. If it is not truth within your soul, then don't accept it. Don't accept it. And some things we will never know why as long as we're in this human body. We don't have the perspective to know. So I've been thinking about this all week, about um, questioning, questioning, questioning. And I got really into my head and really happy about how I came from this church that told me, don't ask a question. And now I make a living asking questions, <laughs> which is way cool. And then I started thinking, turn it around. I need to question myself. Why did I do that? Why do I think this? What am I, what do I have to gain when I speak something? Do I have an agenda? Am I speaking from my heart or am I reacting against something that I don't like? I have to ask myself, yikes, I don't like that. So what do I believe? I have to ask, what do I believe that I'm not questioning? Because if I'm holding a belief, I will act from that belief. And if I don't question that belief, then I may be acting from something that I don't really want to believe or want to act from. So I have to ask myself, what do I believe that I'm not questioning? Am I believing things because to believe otherwise might be too hard? I tell you what, black and white is easy. Good and bad is easy. A billion shades of gray is hard. It's hard and we would rather do what's easy. We would rather go, oh, I saw one black thing about you. That's all I need to know. I'm going to put you in that pigeonhole. Now I don't have to think about you ever again. And now when someone else says what you said, I'm putting them in the same pigeonhole. I don't even have to go through the process with them. They're just all over there. All those people who voted that way. All those people who believe in this religion. All the people who wear these clothes. All the people who whatever. We do that because to question takes time, it takes effort, and I don't know about you, but it stirs up some fear in me. Like, what if I get an answer and I don't like it? Or what if I get an answer and I see that it's the right answer, but I have to change my life because I'm not living according to it? That's hard. It's hard. So what I need to question where the places that I'm most comfortable. If I'm too comfortable, I know this, I believe it to be true, then it behooves me to ask, oh, I don't know, once or twice a year, is that still true? 
Do you still believe it? Are you acting from it? What does your life look like because you believe that? Or are you just saying you believe it because it sounds good, but you're not really believing it? I have to ask those questions. It's easy to, to make assumptions, to make unconscious agreements that do not serve us. And so we ask the question, who am I? Who am I? Talked about in the newsletter this month that um, Bearheart, who wrote the book that we just finished in our class a few weeks ago, The Wind is My Mother, comes from a Native American Lakota tradition. He was also trained as a doctor of psychology in American college, uh, university. So he had this great Native American background where he was taught by two different medicine men and brought up in that culture. And he also had this Western education. And he asked a lot of questions. And he says, the questions we all need to ask ourselves are, who am I? Who am I? Who am I really? And then what have I become? Because if you look at what you've become and what's actually showing up in your life, that will clarify whether the who am I that you believe is actually the who am I that you are living from. How do I show up? Am I behaving as who I think I am? So we ask those questions. And then from there we go, and what is mine to do? I believe that I'm here as an expression of God, that God lives in me and in you and in everybody, not me more than any other single soul, no matter how they voted, no matter where they live, no matter how mean they've been to me. God is in them every bit as much as God is in me. Do I always act like that? I would like to say that I do. I would like to say that. But it's not true, so I'm not going to. But I try, and I try to keep asking the question, am I behaving as who it is that I say that I am? Who it is that I say I believe I am? What is mine to do comes from that. So what am I here to do? And that's a, the big question. What am I here to do? I believe I'm here to love. I'm pretty good at loving. I'm pretty good at it. I've had a lot of practice. And I don't do it all the time. <laughs> I don't do it all the time. So another question to ask is, what is right? What is right? We think we know. This is right. This is wrong. Is it? Maybe it is. But if you don't ask the question, you may accept someone else's answer for what is right. And if you do that, then you are doing a disservice to yourself and to God because God made you to express God as you. So if you start expressing God as someone else because you didn't take the time to figure out who you are, then you are doing a disservice to the world, to yourself, to God, who's like, I've already been that guy. I want to be who you are. Who are you? Be the you that you can be. What is mine to do? What is right? And who decides? Who decides what is right? You know, sometimes other people decide what is right in the laws, and then we follow those laws because we don't want to be punished. But in our heart of hearts, we have to decide what is right for us and follow that. And, you know, Jesus, they, the Pharisees tried to trick him a lot, and they would say, okay, here's a coin. It's got Caesar's head on it. So you say you follow God. Um, what about, are you saying that Caesar's not the emperor? Are you saying that Caesar's not God on earth? And Jesus very carefully said, well, I will, pay I will pay Caesar what is due Caesar, and I will pay God what is due God. What is due God? All my love. What is due Caesar? I follow these rules so I can get along. Or I decide not to follow these rules and I get in trouble. Either one is a legitimate des decision. Either one is a legitimate decision, but if you don't ever ask, then you're probably doing what somebody else told you to do. And this is not about being antagonistic, this necessity of asking questions. It's not at all about, oh yeah, oh yeah. It's not that. Although I have to say I kind of went through a phase of, oh yeah, before I kind of went, okay, no, I can ask the questions I want. I don't, I don't have to, 
don't have to do it pugilistically. I don't have to fight anybody. I don't have to make anyone else wrong. Have you ever thought about that? You can be right about something without having to make anyone else wrong because guess what? They're on their own journey. They're expressing God as them to the best of their ability. If it doesn't look good to you, none of your business. None of your business. What do you have control over? Right here. So it's not about being antagonistic. It's about being present to what is. It's about not deciding somewhere back there in the past and then closing your mind and acting from there forever and ever. It's about today and this moment and the next moment and the next moment and the next moment. What do I believe now? Who am I now? What is right now? What is the decision I want to make? How do I show up as love? How do I show up as not violent? How do I do that? It is most present It is being in the present. Asking those questions allow us to do that. And anytime we're not in the presence, then we may be reacting from something we're afraid is going to happen or that we're trying to manipulate to happen in the future, or we're reacting from something that was decided in the past either by us or someone else and may or may not still be relevant. And so we bring it all into the present. We can't rest on our laurels. There is no laurels. We cannot close doors because of our fear. As soon as we close a door, we can no longer see what's behind it. And so we keep the doors open, and that's hard. It's not easy to do. It's not easy to do. And I'll tell you, you all know that my husband's in a rehab hospital right now. He fell and he broke his hip. He's rehabbing well. He's going to get out of the hospital, um, hopefully by the end of this week. But there's an underlying issue that made him fall in the first place. And it's made him fall like nine times in the past two years, just kind of out of nowhere. And so I'm trying to get answers about that. I'm trying to get doctors to listen to me saying, all of these things are happening. So something else is going on. And if you just rehab his hip and send him back out into the world, he's going to fall again. And I've been mad because they're not listening to me. And I realized as more and more higher ups from the rehab hospital that he's in keep coming to the room asking me, and how are you today, Mrs. Allen? (laughs) Because I was like, oh, they're kind of scared of me. They're scared I'm going to give them a bad rating because I haven't been ugly. But when they've asked me questions, I didn't seek anybody out. They're like, how's everything going? Well, I'm glad you asked. Let me tell you what my concerns are. And then, ooh. But I realized a couple of days ago, you know what? You are not serving anybody, not Bob, not yourself, not this hospital, not any doctor here, by allowing yourself to get angry about this. Either they're going to address it or they're not going to address it. And so if they're not going to, you need to find out who will and stop putting energy toward trying to make them do something that they're not going to do and scaring people. I think I'm a very likable and not scary at all person. (laughs) But I realized that some of these people acted a little scared of me. They talked about, you know, you're going to be sent a survey after all this is over. (laughs) And we really want tens. You know, even eights are not acceptable. We don't like nines. We really want tens. I was like, okay, well, do a 10 job and I'll give you a 10. I didn't say that. But I realized, oh, you know, how am I showing up here? I feel like I'm showing up as love for my husband because I want good things for him. But am I showing up as love for everyone in the situation? And I had to really take a look at that and maybe change my behavior a little bit. Hmm, imagine that. So trying to be present day to day with what is, asking those questions and acting from the answers to those questions. I know that you are doing it in your life, and I urge you to do even more. Thank you. And we're going to take those questions into a short meditation. So just take a deep breath and allow yourself to be in your body. Oh, yeah, this body. Allow it to relax. 
As you breathe, just do a quick scan. How's your head? If you feel tension in your temples or the crown of your head, your eyebrows, your forehead, send them some love and consciously relax that tension if you can. And check out your jaw, your mouth, are you holding tension there? Breathe through it and allow it to relax. Send it some love. Now one of the hardest workers in your body is your neck. It's got to hold up that big head full of so many ideas, day after day after day. So if there's tension there, just send it some love. Maybe some gratitude. Thank you. Thank you for doing a good job holding up my head. I'm going to allow you to relax a little. If you're feeling tightness through your chest or your shoulders, breathe into that space with love. Our bodies hold what we believe, regardless of what our minds tell them. So if you have tension in your arms or your hands or your fingers, send them some love and invite them to just take a break for a while. Just lie there and relax. Relax your abdominal muscles. No one's looking at you. You can let it all hang out. Relax your torso. Send it some love for holding all those internal organs that allow you to be you in this world, in this vessel that we call a body. This vessel of God. And say thank you to your sitting bones for holding you up. And consciously release any tension you might be holding in those muscles or in your thighs or your knees. Your calves or your feet. Send love to the very toes of you. And from this place of love and relaxation, it is easier to believe, oh yes, I am a body of love. I am a vessel through which God can move about the world. I am unique, and also I am one with all that is. And it's a lot easier to love from that place. It's a lot easier to believe in love. And from that place of not holding on to the tightness within us, it is easier to act from that love. The truth is there's nothing threatening you. Not in any true way. Yeah, the body comes and goes, but you... This precious, beloved spirit cannot be harmed. And so you allow it to be the love. You allow the truth of you to be the love that you are. You give permission. You give encouragement. You know what? Love that I am, I'm encouraging you to express through my body, through my thoughts, through my words, through my expressions. Mm -hmm. 
May the love that I believe that I am be shown in the features of my face. May it be demonstrated in the tenderness of my touch. May I walk about the earth gently, not destroying that which is in my path but seeing all that is around me as expressions of God's love as well. May I love more easily. May I take that which I fear or that which I think I know without question and ask the question why are you afraid this thing you think you know do you really know it how do you know it have you experienced it and then listen for the answers they are within you the answer to everything outside of yourself is already within you. That's what Jesus said. It's not up in heaven. It's not down in hell. It's not somewhere across the continent. It's right here. With you, in you, as you. And you get to just love. Live from love. Accept love. Give love. In every moment, a new for the fact that we can do this, that we can even have the thought that this is possible for us, that we get to live as the love that we were created to be. We are so grateful. I get to do this. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you.